this video is part of my series on taking high school publications online and in this video I'm going to talk about writing for the web. So the biggest thing to remember is that online audiences are not the same kind of audiences or readers as your audience for your print publication. Online audiences are scanners. And if we look at why this is, um, it really goes back to just what the web is and how it works. So with print publications, print is very author driven. Everything is prepackaged. Uh, your student journalists are selecting what stories they think are important and sending those out in a print publication. So they're acting as gatekeepers and they're creating just a few selected options. And so they're just kind of giving the reader info and they're saying, you know, here is everything that we think is important. So you hand your students create this publication, they hand it to another student and they say everything in here we think is important. We put it in the order we think is important and we want you to read it. And so, um, Oh, this can come out. Um, with the web, the web is very user driven and it's customizable. There's seemingly unlimited options. And so audiences approach the web as sort of this exercise in self selection. Instead of being given a list of what is important, people online, audiences online, they find what is important to them. So the web is all about searching for information, not being given information. So the audiences for these two venues are much different. Even though they're the same people, they're approaching what they're doing in a different way. Print, readers given info. Web, people are searching for info. So the mindset is just much, much different. And with the web, that means you're competing with any number of other organizations, news outlets, distractions. So people have to be able to find you, they have to be able to figure out what you're about, and they have to find something that they like that will keep them coming back. They also have to have some easy way of keeping in touch with you so they can continue following you without having to go to your website every day. So to understand how to write for the web, you have to understand two things. First of all, how people read the web. So you can understand how people will view your site and find information. And also how search engines will read the web. So people can find your information with Google. So how do people read the web? Well, studying how people read the web has generally be done with, been done with eye tracking devices. And uh, here's an example of a military application of an eye tracking device being used to determine what this research subject, in this case a pilot, is looking at on the dash of his plane. So eye tracking studies have been done with the web where people have been fitted with this device and asked to use websites or find information and we can see what people are looking at and kind of what they're doing online and where they look. So how do people read for print? Well, for print you're probably familiar with the Z or backwards S. Uh, pattern for scanning. When people see a print design, their eye sort of scans from the top left over to the top right, then they come down across the page diagonally, and then scan from the bottom left to the bottom right. That is not the case online. Online, people don't read the web, they scan it, just like when they first scan that print page, but they scan it in an F-shaped pattern. So people sort of start in the upper left and they just go across to the right and as the page gets longer the shorter their gaze from left to right becomes so you end up with this f-shaped pattern um, this has several implications it means this means that you need to have the really important information that people are looking for at the top left that's why the logo is almost always at the top left you need to have those headlines up at the top and anything at the bottom is not going to be seen as much. So you don't want to put really important stuff down at the bottom. So if you write an article about a family that uh, lost their house in a fire and you are accepting donations, you do not want to put that donation button all the way at the bottom of the article because a lot of people who look at this page, they're not actually going to read it, they're just going to kind of scan over it and they'll never get to the bottom. So they won't even know that's there. So you want to get uh, anything that's really important up at the top. So this also means that people see the first words of the headline, the article, they see any bullet points, subheads, quotes, anything that stands out, they will see as they scan the page. Things that don't stand out will not be seen. So going back to that example of like a donation button, 
If you have that, you want to make sure that the button is big and obviously a button. If it just looks like regular text, it just is part of the story, again, people probably won't see it um, as easily. So you want to put the important stuff at the top and you also want to break your text up. So here's an example from Cracked. They have the headline at the top, the name of the author, so people are just sort of scanning over this and looking for the big bold words. So you, even if you're very lazy about looking at this, Five Myths People Don't Realize Admitted Hoaxes by C. Coville, Add to Favorites Picture, it's no surprise the world's taken by hoaxers. Number five, so I can tell this is going to be a countdown from five down to one. And then we have that headline, uh, that subhead, number five, the name of that myth, and then it's separated by lines. So what this does is it allows scanners to just sort of see the basic information, and then they can judge whether or not they want to read the full article. So they can see the headline, the author, this picture, the first couple words of the article, and then this first part of the list. It takes just a few seconds to figure out what this article is and to make a judgment on whether or not you want to read it. And web audiences do typically make judgments very quickly. Um, they make a judgment about a site in six to eight seconds. So you have to have all these, you need, you need a headline, you need a subhead, you need to have all these different visual cues that help people understand in just a few seconds what they're looking at. So how do you do that? How do you provide info to people who aren't really paying attention? And again, this goes back to that example we just looked at. You want to employ scannable text, but you also want to employ concise text and objective text. And usability research, Jacob Nielsen has done a ton of research into reading online, and this is what he has found and what he suggests will work, and in fact does work, and increases the usability of your site and the memorability of your content. So let's talk about scannable text. You want to use bulleted or numbered lists whenever possible. Um, if you have lists, don't type them out in paragraph form. Just create actual bulleted lists. Use hyperlinks or bold words to draw attention to important pieces of information in your article. Uh, you want to have one idea per paragraph. So you have short paragraphs. And you want to use the inverted pyramid, which really your students should be using anyway. So a really good example of using hyperlinks or bold words is CNN. Uh, here's an article that just came out today. And you can see they have a teaser at the top, story highlights, and it's just bulleted. And then as you go through the story, you know, Washington, that's highlighted in bold. And then there's links throughout the CNN story. So you can read the ruling. Uh, Oh yeah, and then it's a couple links at the bottom. And then their paragraphs are very, very short with a space between them. So this article doesn't look like it's that much work to get through. And there's plenty here for the scanner who's trying to decide whether or not to read this. We have the headline, we have the author, we've got the video, we've got the name of the video, story highlights, Washington, question here. So even if you don't really read this, you see Supreme Court, Voting Rights, Bill Muir, Supreme Court Limits Voting Rights Act, Story Highlights, Supreme Court, um, U.S. Oversight, Ruling, Congress, let me pull up on Congress, Washington, 5-4 to four vote. So people who don't read the whole article still get a lot of information about what this is, and that might actually entice them to read the article. So that's what we want to do to create scannable text. And just as an example, I used um, these examples in a workshop that I put together for a high school publication. So I found examples on their publication. And on the left is a paragraph about um, some changes set in place by the high Indiana High School Athletic Association. Here it is in paragraph form on the left. And here it is on, in bullet point form on the right with links. So on the left, if I don't read that, I pretty much have no idea what it's about. On the right, if I don't read it, there's some words that are jumping out at me. Indiana High School Athletic Association, class system, baseball, basketball, football. So I get the idea that this is about sports. If I care about sports, I might now be enticed to read this whole article. Okay, you also want to use concise text. And really, as journalists, your students should be doing this anyway. They should be cutting their word count down as much as possible. So for example, uh, this is the about section of a high school publication. This is their old about on the left. 
and a new one that's rewritten to be more concise on the right. This is stuff you should be doing anyway. You just want to cut out words that are unnecessary. So on the left, um, the purpose of NCHS Live is to provide a gateway of multimedia broadcasting to the visitors of our site. Why do we need that many words? Why do we need the purpose of? Why don't we just say NCHS Live provides multimedia? Um, what is a gateway of multimedia broadcasting? That is completely unnecessary. Um, just say you're providing multimedia broadcasting. Um, some sources of information will be taken from the newspaper. How about some stories come from the newspaper? Um, what sources of information? What is that? Is it stories? Probably just call it stories. Um, one major feature of the website is to get users involved in making it possible for them to interact through comments on stories. How about this? NCHS Live seeks to involve users with the site and each other through story comments and links to other sites. So just get rid of those words that you don't need. Words that are vague, like uh, making it possible, provide a gateway. Um, just get rid of all that and be concise. Because people don't like to read wordy stuff on the internet. And then finally, you want to have objective text. Now, your students should be doing this anyway. They should be objective because they're journalists. They should at least try their best. Um, we can argue in another video about <laughs> journalistic objectivity. But um, one way to be objective that I think a lot of people don't think about is including hyperlinks. When your students cite sources outside of their own reporting, um, you know, their own interviews, when they look at data from websites or reports, they should link to that data. And that actually increases the credibility of their article. Studies into web credibility have found that hyperlinking to other sites that are reputable increases the credibility of your own site. So if your students write an article about lack of sleep and they cite the article cites a sleep study, Put a link to that study so your audience can click that link and read the study for themselves and see that you are in fact interpreting the study correctly. This also, hyperlinking is also a strategy for scanning, creating scannable text. So over on the left, if I don't read that, I have no idea what it's about. On the right, if I don't read it, I still have these words that are jumping out at me. I see sleep deprivation, 2012 sleep study, and Kim LaPert. So this is obviously about sleep deprivation. Now with hyperlinking, uh, there is kind of an art to it. You want to make sure you are hyperlinking, turning into links, words that make sense. You never, ever, ever want to have right here, click here and make that highlighted. People will not click a link if they don't know where it goes. And you know that because you get emails with weird links and if you don't know where it goes, you probably don't click it. So never highlight, click here and make that a link. You want the link to be descriptive. So if the administration is starting an athletic club, don't say for more information, click here. Just say the administration started a new athletic club and then make athletic club the link. People will know exactly where it's going. The administration started a new athletic club. Clearly when I click on it, I'm going to the administration's athletic club. Okay, and just an example of all three of these put together. The article on the left is uh, pretty much just a list of placings at a sporting event with a quote. Um, what you can do to make this scannable online is put in some links. So let's put a link to the state championship site so I can go see who else won. And then bold, you know, this is articles about how there's a boys team and a girls team and we're looking at what they qualified for. So let's bold girls team and just bullet point what they did and then highlight or bold boys team and just bullet point what they did and then you can start putting the rest of your article, you know, type in your quote down here. Uh, that way people who don't really read online, who are just scanning around, can look at this and see it's clearly a state championship something. There's a girls team, a boys team, and look at all this stuff that they qualified for. Um, I highly suggest doing something like CNN does and having story highlights or some kind of um, descriptor at the top. Uh, the Lakota East Spark has this really cool web feature where they do a profile on a student, you know, each week or what have you, and it's very well done. You have a headline, and then you have little about 
blurbs about this student. So I immediately see the word senior profile, so clearly I know what this is, even if I'm not really paying attention or reading very much. I can see a few things about him. Hopefully this will get me interested into in reading the article. There's his picture. There's a caption. So this is really broken up. The paragraphs are nicely sized. Um, there's all this stuff that's making the page scannable, the headline, the bullet points. And then there's quotes in here that they've pulled out some pull quotes. You can do this with WordPress. Every WordPress theme comes with a, a pull quote maker. So this is a really, really, I mean, they've just done a really good job here. And then they've got some extra photos down at the bottom. So there's plenty here for the scanning reader to hopefully get that person interested in reading the full article. So if you are from the Lakota East Spark, um, you are doing a great job. You are awesome. I think you guys know that, though. I feel like you win a lot of contests. So. But your website, it's great. Uh, so you want to employ that scannable, concise, and objective text. Now with headlines, since people read in an F-shaped pattern, you want to do what's called front-loading. You want the headline to have the most important words at the beginning. So here again, the Spark is doing a great job because they label senior profile. If they just put Danny McClary, uh, it, who, how would you know what that is? Is it a profile? Is he a sports star? Is it like a teacher? You have no idea. So. In the first couple words of the headline, they just tell you. And what all of this adds up to is what's called a create an information scent. It creates what's called an information scent. So the information scent here on the Spark is senior profile, movie, superhero, sports team, dream job, um, article, picture of the guy, I see my friends and classmates. So even if you don't read this, it's clearly, very, very clearly, the information is sent is telling us this is a profile about a student who is into sports or something. So he's wearing my university shirt. So you get the idea. So with headlines, everything should be descriptive, which is the same idea as what you're doing with Twitter. Passive can actually be okay, and not having full sentences can be okay. So here's senior profile, Danny McClary. That's a terrible headline for print, but it's perfect for the web. And then um, you want to avoid lingo words people don't quite use often or don't understand. You want to use old words for things. You know, senior profile is great. It doesn't need to be like, you know, getting to know. It could just, senior profile is good. So an example, um, school board announces new superintendent. That's a great headline. If I only see the first couple words, I see it's about the school board. But su new superintendent named is even better because I see that word superintendent further toward the beginning of the headline. It's okay that it's passive. Passive is okay for the web, for the headlines. You still want your articles to be an active voice. And just an example of front loading. Um, a lot of times people don't read entire headlines. They just kind of scan over them. So if you were just on a site, and you're kind of scrolling back and forth, and you saw this, uh, it just catches your eye, you immediately know what all of these are about. Or if you're using an RSS feed, and you're pulling articles in from a site, and you're getting them on your phone or something, and you're not seeing the full headline, these are all front-loaded. Rob Lowe, Tosh.0, oh, you know what all these are about. And I'll show you the whole headline. You know, they were exactly what you thought they were for, because all the important parts of these headlines is at the beginning. So Game of Thrones, Sean being stabbed. Game of Thrones is first because they're going to get the widest audience with that. Any Game of Thrones fan is going to see that and be interested. Master Chef, five things that made us sour. They put Master Chef because again, people recognize that brand. They, you know, the show. They will want to read the article. Don't forget that your web page has a fold. Uh, information at the top is more likely to be seen. So when you do little pullouts like this uh, that the Spark has done, you want it to be at the top. Same with CNN. They put their story highlights up here at the top above the fold. This is where the fold ends right here. So here's above the fold. And then all the just text with nothing interesting is toward the bottom. Um, scrolling is always better than paging. You want to, you know, you can, people can scroll all day long like this. You don't want to separate into pages, which you probably won't on WordPress anyway because it's kind of a pain. So if the top is informative, the bottom is more likely to be read. So if a person looks at this CNN article and they see this really informative top section with a headline, highlights, dateline, 
you know, a little sentence here with more information, they're more likely to actually keep reading that and scroll down. Um, kids these days, kids these days. Uh, just a quick note on teens. The perception a lot of times is that teenagers are these kind of tech geniuses. You know, we call them digital natives because they grew up in the world where digital already existed. They weren't handed a computer when they were 20 and told they had to learn it. And they use the internet for everything. That's the perception. But the reality is that students, high school students, are actually easily bored online. They, they do actually underperform adults in web usage. So there was a study conducted in which teenagers and adults were given different tasks to complete online and students underperformed adults by 10%. Uh, they have insufficient reading skills, they have less developed research strategies, they lack patience a lot of times, and you know they just don't like reading a whole lot. Um, a lot of this information comes from Jacob Nielsen and studies that he's performed on the difference in readership and readership styles between adults and teenagers. So what this means is that getting teens to read, you know, interactivity is really the key. Online quizzes, forms where students can participate in your publication by sending letters or tips, online voting, games, features for sharing photos and stories, message boards, um, they love anything that's interactive. Anytime they can be doing something, uh, they're better off on your site. So if readers scan the web for information and um, a lot of teenagers aren't great at doing that, what kind of articles are appropriate for your website? Well, the web really rewards coverage that's comprehensive but more specific. People get online to do something or to find information. Um, so give them something useful. People want helpful information, they want actionable content, and they want help doing things. Print is really linear. You tell the story, but online users create their own experience. They only interact with stories that are interesting to them. They only read up to a point that they get bored. So you want to try to be as helpful to them as possible. So for example, if you have a print story about summer jobs, you might have anecdotes, you might do features on students, you might talk about job statistics, and that's all great for print. But online, you want to offer something to your readers. So having a list of places in town that are hiring is super helpful for high school students. And since it's online, you can update it. If they stop hiring, you can just take the list, you know, the name off the list. Having some kind of location-based info on the best places to work would be amazing. If your students, if your student reporters could make a Google map of all the places in town that hire teenagers, that's super valuable to your audience. Um, for a web story about summer jobs, you could even have tips for your resume and offer, offer high school students who are in your audience a bullet-pointed list of what's going to help make their resume stand out. You could also provide links to hiring sites, and you can't do a lot of this in print. Uh, because it, with print, it's kind of set in stone. With the web, all of these things you can change. If you learn new tips, you can add new tips to your list. If uh, some of the high sites that are hiring stop hiring, you can just take that link off. But I also want to stress that variety is the spice of life. So even though your web content should be concise, it should be scannable, it should be more actionable and offer more links and um, interactive elements, you can also publish traditional feature style articles, you know. So for your web story on summer jobs, maybe take this stuff from print and then add this stuff to it. So you want to mix it up and provide options, you know, give readers some salad that's healthy for them, some good reading, some important facts and information with uh, their sausage, bacon, double cheeseburger, which is their guilty pleasure, their uh, location, their map of where to get jobs, their polls, their silly uh, contests that you can run and stuff like that. So mix it up a little bit. Um, real quick, the last thing I want to talk about is photos. On social media, photos are the number one activity that people engage in is looking through photos, except on Twitter, just because of how Twitter is set up. But on websites, generic photos are basically ignored. People only look at photos that have real information. So uh, in this example, this is an eye tracking, out, the output of an eye tracking study of a site that uses generic photos and a site that uses real photos. Pottery Barn has actually set up their products in what looks like real houses and put people's stuff on it so it looks like all the products are in use. Here the products are just fake. They're just a picture of a TV with a 
screen photoshopped on it. So here you can see people don't look at the pictures. There's nothing they're going to get out of looking at these pictures. Here people love the pictures. Look at how much the blue is wherever people have looked. Look at how much people look at the pictures on the site with real pictures versus the site with kind of these fake pictures. So you don't want to use stock pictures on your site. Okay, that's how people read the web. How do search engines read the web? I'm going to try and get through this pretty quickly, but people are going to find your content by Googling. The majority of news articles are found through Google. The next highest sharing source is Facebook. So you want your site to be Google friendly. So when you see a website, you see the output of the code. You see what the code compiles everything into. Google sees the code. So for this site, you might see NCHS Live, you see the navigation bar, you see the pictures. Google sees the title, it sees that it's using WordPress, it sees the official website of North Central High School, and then it sees a link to the style sheet and a bunch of other code. And again, just another example, this is what you see on the left, this is what your Google engine sees on the right. And here, this is interesting, here's the picture of basketball. Um, if you look where that picture is, um, the name of that picture is DSRLEA, so DSR leaving one.jpg. Okay, Google has no clue what that is. Um, so if someone is searching for NCHS Live picture of basketball, this picture will like never come up. So a couple tips to optimize for search engines. Make sure that your site title is very descriptive. So even if your publication is uh, sort of shorthand for your school or for your publication name, make sure you put in the title the whole name of your school and the whole name of your publication. You also want to use really precise words, so you might want to say, you know, the high school newspaper, the online student newspaper of blank 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 high school, instead of saying like publication or media course or something like that. Um, you want to use keywords in your writing, so think about what people might search for if they're looking for you. You can add those during your, the editing stage. So I suggest, um, for example, if you have football stories, always spelling out the name of your high school the first time it's referenced in the football story. So spell out the whole name. Instead of saying, like, our football team, you know, is going to state, right, the North Central High School football team, comma, the Red Devils or whatever, um, will be advancing to the state competition. Name your photos, whatever the photo actually is. Uh, videos are not really searchable, so if you have a video on your site, you need to put a sentence or two underneath it that describes what it is. CNN does this, they put a little header under the video. So Google doesn't really know what this photo is, so CNN has given it this headline, Supreme Court Limits Voting Rights Act, so now if people search for voting rights video, this might come up. And then um, finally, hyperlinking, bumps you up in Google. The more other sites link to you, the more trustworthy Google thinks you are. So if you can get other publications or people in your community to link to your site, that will only help you. So I hope that's helpful. I know it was kind of a long discussion. I usually try to keep my lectures about 15 minutes, but there's just so much to talk about in this one. But I hope that you learned something about writing for the web. You know, I always suggest creating assignments where students go out to CNN, you know, you can have them print this article and have them take a highlighter and highlight where the information sent comes from. And the information sent comes from all the large and bold and bullet pointed words. So print it out, have them highlight the headline, highlight this, highlight story highlights over here, highlight the bold words, highlight the, uh, here's more bullet points actually, highlight the bullet points here, highlight these um, links at the bottom and just have them look at how much of this article has special care and attention giving to, given to it because it's on the web. You could also um, have them take, one thing I like to do is have students take an article from print and rewrite it for the web and make a list of story highlights and create a new web headline and create a list of links that could be included in the story. Those are just my suggestions. If you have any questions about writing for the web, please feel free to let me know. You also should check out, and I apologize, this site has moved, but Jacob Nielsen, writing for the web. 
Um, it just moved recently. It used to be at useit.com, but now it is at N, N Group. So um, I highly suggest reading his articles on writing for the web. Everything I've talked about pretty much comes from there. I've just provided my own examples. So another thing you can do is have the students read this and then, you know, create some examples of website articles. That's it. I hope it helps. Can't wait to see all of your websites.